Hey, hey, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today on this live stream. Uh, it's an exciting day. I'm finally uh, releasing my first book called Freedom at Risk, How to Protect Your Personal and Financial Freedoms. And we are going to have a lot of, a lot of fun today. Uh, we have some great guests, uh, and I'll share those names with you. Uh, but uh, first and foremost, I want to share why, um, why it's so important, uh, especially right now, to understand our freedoms and why they are at risk, right? Uh, I think it's very timely because there's a lot of turmoil happening in our world, right? And I think people do need some guidance to help them understand what's happening in the world, what's happening in this country, and what's happening to their freedoms, right? So this book is very timely. Um, and then uh, the way the book was developed, um, it's very educational. Uh, we have it separated into two parts. We have part one, which walks through in great detail um, how the education system impacts our freedoms, how society is impacting our freedoms, how politics impacts our freedoms. I think we're all familiar with that piece, right? Um, and then we go on to how the economy can impact our freedoms, right? Today, we're looking at, you know, potentially facing into a recession, if not already in a recession, right? So we got to take a look at how the economy impacts our freedoms, as well as, and separately, the monetary system, right? The monetary system that we have, which is based on fiat currency, is stealing some of our freedoms by stealing our purchasing power through inflation, right? And we've all felt inflation over this past um, over this past couple of years, right? So I think we can understand how our freedoms are being stolen in each one of those ways. So in the book, in part one, I detail all those different ways uh, our freedoms are at risk uh, to be able to help the reader um, kind of wrap their head around that. And uh, in some cases, you know, I'm not looking for the reader to buy into, you know, what I'm writing about. Um, I put the information out there. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to stimulate some some thought um, in the reader to be able to have them think about how the world is affecting them, how the the policies in this country are impacting them, how society, what's happening, whether it be woke culture or, uh, or or what have you, how that is all impacting their freedoms, right? So uh, I think that's very important for us to understand. And, and I could have stopped there with just part one, but I didn't. I actually created part two of the book, which is equally, if not more so important than part one. And part two speaks to what you can do to protect your personal and financial freedoms, right? There's there's two different types of freedoms as I describe them. Your personal freedoms, uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of certain things you, you can do versus financial freedoms uh, that can be stolen, right? So I've divided those into their own categories and uh, I go into great length to talk about how we can protect those personal and financial freedoms. So that's great stuff there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we just develop a lot of different action plans that the reader can take action on, right? And some of these things are extremely difficult. I don't, I don't want folks to think it's a very elaborate, um, you know, uh, plan that they got to, you know, oh my God, I got to go do X, Y, and Z. Some things are very simple. Like for example, one of the things in protecting your personal freedom that I've done is create a backyard garden, right? That's something I've created over the last couple of years that is wonderful because it gives me a sense of my personal freedom, right? I grow fruits and vegetables and actually this year uh, expanded it to include potatoes, right? And so this year, you know, uh, we'll probably harvest somewhere around 200 potatoes out of that out of that garden. And so there's a certain amount of freedom that comes along with that to be able to grow your own fruit and vegetables and not have to worry about getting everything from the grocery store, right? So that's a relatively simple thing that somebody can do, even if they just have a very small backyard or an apartment, right? Uh, one of our guests uh, is, um, 
Sean Conley, and he does a lot of um, uh, sustainment type activities and helping people understand what they can do. So I'm excited uh, to have him on today as a guest to talk about uh, just that and some of the little things we can do in our lives. Okay, so that's all good stuff. Um, and so as we go through this live stream today with our guests, we're going to be talking about all these different issues in our world today, and we're going to be talking about actions people can take. I also have my my uh, my editor, my book editor, Ashley, is going to be joining us uh, today. This is super exciting. She has been such a, a tremendous uh, role, had a tremendous role in, in creating this book, and I, I am so blessed uh, that she was on my team. Uh, because she did a fantastic job. So I'm so excited to have her here today to talk about her experience, right? And to just give her unbiased view of what she thinks about the book and, you know, what value she believes it can have uh, for the reader. So that's going to be our, a real fun conversation. So uh, some of the other guests uh, we are going to be having on, uh, Mark Victor Hansen, who wrote the um, Chicken Soup for the Soul, book series, right? Very successful individual. He's done great things. And with Mark Victor Hansen, uh, he's going to be joined by his wife, Crystal Hansen. They are beautiful people. I've met them many times over. Such wonderful people, such giving people. Um, if you're not following uh, Mark on, um, on, say, social media, take a look, uh, find him on social media, look him up and give him a follow. So, um, so he's going to be joining us along with Crystal Hansen. We're also going to have, like I mentioned, Ashley Ditello is going to be joining us. She's been my editor through this process. We're going to have Jen Costanza joining us. She is a business consultant. She's helped me in my business uh, many times over. And so uh, Jennifer is going to be joining us and sharing her perspectives on freedoms and what actions we can take to protect ourselves. Uh, and then we are going to have Sean Conley uh, join us. He's the individual I mentioned that helps folks with uh, sustainability type um, activities. And uh, he has a company called Five Stone Strategy, and they're doing fantastic things. Uh, you know, I've, I've actually met with one of his clients and they're absolutely loving what he's doing for them. So he's, uh, he's going to share with us some, some great Intel. Uh, we also have Eli Vo. Eli Vo. Oh my God. He is, <laughs> Eli is a rock star when it comes to real estate. And, uh, not only that, he's just a generally all around good guy, right? Um, he helps people create wealth for themselves, create greater freedoms for themselves in terms of helping people get into real estate through syndications, right? A lot of folks thinks, think they have to do real estate on their own. They have to go buy a duplex or some sort of multifamily and manage it and deal with tenants and all that sort of stuff. You can, you can do that all on your own, but Really, a syndication is a is a much more elegant solution that people have for themselves to be able to uh, get into real estate, yeah, and and derive all the benefits from real estate, right? Because there's many, and he and I will talk about it on this live stream when he comes on. Uh, but uh, you have through a syndication, you have a very professional team who has done all of all of those things before, right? They have professional uh, negotiating skills, right? When they purchase a building, they have professional property management in place, right? Who knows everything there is to know and how to take care of a, you know, a building, right? Uh, they have professional staff when it comes to having to deal with tenants, lease renewals, right? Or new leases, putting new leases in place. They have the knowledge in terms of what the market is doing in their particular area to be able to make sure their rents are adjusted appropriately, right? Uh, so being able to invest in real estate through a syndication to be able to help people grow their wealth for financial freedom, and then having that wealth to protect their personal freedoms, 
man, Eli, he's just a rock star in being able to help people do that. So God bless him. I'm glad he's a friend of mine. I'm glad he's on my team, you know, so to speak. And, uh, you know, just again, great guy. So he's going to be talking to us about that stuff. We have uh, Josh Lassard. Now, Josh, I am, I, I am so excited to have Josh on because he is a 19-year-old macroeconomic enthusiast. Okay. So um, there's a lot going on in the macroeconomic space, right? And for a 19-year-old to get into it and start to wrap his head around it is, is such an exciting thing for me to see and watch and chat with him about these sort of things, right? And so he's going to come on. He's going to tell us a little bit about what he's doing in the space today and then also share with us his perspective on why this is such an important topic, freedom at risk, right? Why this is such an important topic for young people to start to get educated on and to... um and to start taking action, right? Because the sooner you can take action, the more uh, successful you'll be in creating wealth, creating financial freedom for yourself, and then also creating uh, personal freedoms for yourself, right? So he's going to be joining us a little later. And then uh, lastly, we have my my good friend, really good friend for many, many years, Dmitry Nazarenko. He is a Ukrainian-American. Right. So we all know what's going on in the Ukraine these days. It's very, very sad to see that happening. Um, and so Dimitri is going to share with us his perspective on what's happening in the Ukraine and obviously how that's impacting their freedoms. Right. So uh, having having him on today is very special to me. Uh, not only because he's been a great supporter of the work I've been doing over the last, you know, a year, year and a half to to create this book for folks. He's been a great supporter. But I think also understanding what's happening in the Ukraine, his perspective there is going to be very important and, again, timely for us to understand that piece. So, um, so those are our guests. I'm very excited for that today. And then uh, along with that, um, I, I, for folks that, uh, this may be the first time they're, uh, they're seeing me, watching me, coming in contact with me. I want to share a little bit about, uh, my background. Um, I've started, uh, in real estate probably about 20 years ago at the time I was working in corporate America and, uh, that was, that was great, but it was just a job, you know, making, making a W2 income. Uh, and about 20 years ago, I started buying real estate. And that's uh, that's panned out well for me. I was uh, by doing real estate, I was able to retire at 44 years old, which um, was I, I'm just immensely proud of and is one of the things I share with folks in terms of being able to retire early is a very doable task. Right. That's something we can all do, but we have to take action. And that's one of the things. I, I harp on in the book is we need to take action, right? Um, you can have a lot of faith around these things, right? You can have a lot of hope, but Jesus isn't walking through that door to do these things for you, right? Santa Claus isn't walking through that door. You, you're the one that has to take action, right? And I'm here to help you with that. That's what I want to help you with is to take that action. And it first starts by reading the book, understanding what's happening in the spaces, and um, and then understanding what you personally can do for yourself, right? So um, this is uh, this is this is exciting for me uh, because I get to share my story with folks. Um, and so uh, from that journey, from real estate, uh, and then retiring at age forty-four, I started to get involved and uh, do a lot of studying myself in terms of macroeconomics, right? Uh, so for about four years, five years, I just immersed myself in the macroeconomic space, understanding what's going on with politics, uh, geopolitics, you know, around the world, what's happening in terms of the economy. Um, a lot of folks, unfortunately, these days think of the stock market as the economy. Uh, the stock market is certainly a piece of the economy, but is it is not the entire 
economy, right? There's a lot of different things going on in the economy. So, uh, and again, that's the sort of stuff that, that I teach in the book, Freedom at Risk. So folks start to wrap their head around that. Um, so, uh, so that's, that's what I've been doing for the last four or five years. Um, and then in terms of the, the genesis of the book, the book did not start off as a book at all. Right. Uh, <laughs> many, many of my close, uh, you know, family and friends know this story already, but I'll share it with the rest of you. Um, the, the journey started with me creating a, uh, a white paper for my, for my family, for my niece and for my nephews so that they can understand how, uh, how the world works and how in the many ways, uh, it works against us. And then also share with them what they need to do to protect their personal and financial freedoms. So this really started as me creating a white paper to help my niece and nephews understand what's happening, right? So here I go to my local coffee shop with my laptop. You know, I'm that guy sitting in the corner, banging away at the, the keys on my laptop. And before I knew it, I was at 35,000 words. And at that point, I said, this is no longer a white paper. This is a book. And I had to shift gears somewhat. And again, Ashley was incredibly, um, you know, uh, you know, just such an incredible help in helping me organize the book and create the book uh, that uh, that I couldn't have done it without her. But uh, so at that point, we shifted gears. We created this book and it's really been a labor of love. Now, you know, the genesis. I didn't create this to, you know, make a million bucks. And, you know, uh, you know, we want to sell books. From the perspective of getting the word out to people, we want to be able to get the message out. We want to get the learning out. We want to get these action plans out. That's why we want to get this book out is to help people protect themselves. Right. But now, you know, the genesis, this the, the, the book started from a place of love, a place of wanting my family to be educated and do well for themselves. That's really where this book came from. And so I'm so excited that it is now a book and that I am now able to share it with all of you. Uh, so, um, so thank you again for joining me here today. I truly appreciate that. You can find me on a couple of websites. Um, I have a website specifically for the book. It's called freedomatriskbook.com, right? Freedom at Risk Book. You got to put the book on the end of there, .com. And um there I share with you uh, not only uh, how you can buy the book, but also how you can get your bonuses. We created a ton of different bonuses for this book. And so uh, extreme value uh, alone with those bonuses. So uh, go to freedomatriskbook.com to be able to look at that stuff. And then my own personal website where I help people through consulting and real estate in different, different ways, help to protect their personal and financial freedoms. I have a website called Dirty Boots Capital dot com so you can find me there as well and learn more about what i do so uh so with that i'm gonna stop talking for a little bit and i'm gonna introduce our first guest uh mark victor hansen and uh yeah uh, welcome mark great to have you here Delighted to be with you. Hi. Good morning, every. Well, for me, it's morning, and I know for you, it's afternoon. I'm in uh, I'm Scottsdale, Arizona, where the sun is bright and a little warm right now. Oh, yeah, I bet. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah, no, thank you for joining us here. So for folks that, I don't know how folks may not know you, <laughs> you've been all over. You've done such incredible things. Not only are you a, uh, you know, a motivational speaker and a trainer, you know, you're also a number one New York Times bestselling author for the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. And I don't know anybody who hasn't heard of that book. So congratulations on that. Well, we do, we're delighted. But let's talk about your book, ladies and gentlemen. And I see it, it. And it's nice that people are saying hi to both of us as we go through this. But the most important thing he's teaching is I want to tell you that the high goal of everybody is freedom. It's got to be the top of our triangle. Because with money freedom that he's teaching, then and only then you get time freedom, you get lifestyle freedom, you get purpose freedom. So you can do what you want, when you want, with whom you want, as much as you want, because you can afford it. Because I saw the best sign yesterday, Tony, on the back of a, a plumbing truck. It said, America is not to redistribute wealth. Here you earn it. And that's what you're teaching. You've earned it. 
I've earned it. And and America, America really started sort of with Boston. I know some people think it started with New York and Plymouth Rock and all that, but Boston <laughs> is sort of the think capital of, of America, like Athens was in the old days. Or anyhow, so the the point is 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 what you think about comes about, and he's teaching you to think about freedom, and he's done it from his relatives, which is a wonderful thing because if you understand it at the level of a kid, then you can manifest it as, as the level of an adult because these are critical principles. But they're not one off. Once you own these principles, you own the principles forever and you can do amazing, remarkable things. And that's what Tony is is done. And what he's saying is, hey, wait a second. Look, at I rolled up my metaphorical sleeves. You can roll up your sleeves and go do the same or more. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't mention I, I should have mentioned much of the book is written from a storytelling perspective, right? Uh, I do include some charts and some graphs in there because certain people resonate with charts and graphs and, you know, they uh, they do well there. Uh, but I also want to share some personal stories. Right. So the book is not a, you know, a dry read <laughs> like a, like an educational textbook. You know, I included some fun facts in there, some stories uh, about my personal life. Right. A lot of my person is built into this book so folks can feel like uh we're almost having a conversation as you read through this book, right? It's almost a conversation. So Mark, you know, help us understand. So you're very successful. You've traveled all over the world. You know, you know, how would you specifically define freedom for yourself? Freedom starts on the inside and shows up on the outside. And, and because I'm a scholar and a couple of people, but one is uh, president James Madison. He says, capitalism, which is what you're teaching has self-interest, and it's the only thing that favors all. Now, what he was saying, actually, if, and he was in Boston at the time before he became president, is that if you believe that everyone's going to be virtuous because that's a nice thing to do, it isn't going to work. So he says, once we set up the, remember, he's one of the guys who wrote the Federalist Papers and helped with the Constitution and did it with, with Alexander Hamilton, who everybody has seen the play now that is watching you because they're literate, smart people. Um, and the, the point is that, but Madison's not well known because nobody did a play on him yet or not a real movie. So the point that he's making is self-interest is pro-freedom, it's pro-capitalism, it's pro-free speech, it's pro, you know, and, and what happened is that when I was, one of my companies, we were doing 100 million a year, we had 397 employees, but a heavy, heavy Hispanic population that wanted to become legal immigrants, which you and I are keen on. And so what I taught them is I taught them all the amendments, freedom of speech, right to bear arms, and they all got it, and 100% of them passed. Well, if somebody comes into America, and, and, and we believe in meritocracy, we believe you deserve to be here. You know, that's a level of freedom. We want to keep America free and freedom is not free. And if I'm over waxing on, I don't mean to be. I just need everyone to understand that we're in the most exciting country in the world. Nobody swims to Cuba. Cubans <laughs> fight to get to America because we, 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 you've got free enterprise, which is not free. And, and it means the more enterprising you are, the freer you are. And that's what you're teaching. Yeah, that's the bedrock of America. That's what made America great. America is the super, look, China's trying to, I've been to China 80 times back when they were capitalistically communist. They're trying to be America. America's not trying to be China, but now China thinks they're so big, strong, and mighty. They want everyone to be slaves to communism, which is, is deleterious. I mean, they got 10 million slaves are making like Nike shoes, which is, look, we freed the slaves in, in 1865, basically, and we tried to progressively do it infinitely better. But there's no other country doing that. If if we believe in socialism or you believe in communism, understand that Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, all those guys enslaved people, they'll put you in handcuffs and worse mental handcuffs. And what you're saying is, let's break out the physical, let's break out the mental, let's break out the spiritual and have spiritual, let's have freedom. But it all starts with the bedrock of financial freedom. A absolutely. No, you you nailed it, Mark. Thank you. You're, you're very articulate articulate and being able to uh, share those views. So thank you. Um, one of the things I share with folks uh, relative to our con country and why we need to pay attention to uh, our freedoms and our values and what's happening in our country today is because our democracy was created on uh, three branches of government, right? The executive branch, the legislative branch, and then the judicial branch, right? 
I mean, you learned that in, I don't know, fifth grade or something, or if not sooner. Hopefully, kids are still learning that today in our education system, hopefully, right? But in, the, in terms of those three branches of government, right, we all know in order to become president in this country, there are super PACs that are created. There are fundraising events that are created. It is very money and fundraising intensive. And as a result, the president who's elected, um, you know, is somewhat tied to those organizations and needs to uh, become maybe some moral hazards are created as a result. Right. And I think we've seen that more and more over the years. So as I share with folks, to some degree, I think our executive branch has fallen to corruption to a degree, right? And as it is not upholding the to the same moral standards as the creators of uh, of of uh, of the Constitution would would like the executive branch to aspire to, right? So. I share the executive branch has fallen, then also the legislative branch, right? You know, we were taught again in school, uh, hopefully they're still teaching this, and that's a whole nother conversation about the education system, but hopefully uh, kids are still learning today, you know, about the legislative system. And when I was taught, it was the, uh, the Congress people, the people we voted for would actually be the ones writing the bills that would go through the process to become law. OK. And what's happening today? That's not actually happening. It's the lobbyists. Right. It's the special interest groups who are actually writing the bills. And that is, again, creating moral hazards in the system. So as I share, has the legislative branch fallen to some moral hazards? So if that's the case, this three legged stool of executive branch, legislative branch and then judicial branch, that three legged legged stool is really just hanging on by one leg, the judicial branch. Right. And so we just seen it recently uh, last week. Right. So uh, let me go back, actually, probably two weeks ago on the Supreme Court ruling of Roe v. Wade. Right. Supreme Court came out with their decision and they said, this is what the Supreme Court is saying which is great. You don't have to agree or dis I I'm I'm neutral on the subject. You know, the Supreme Court is the one that's upholding our constitution. They are looking at the constitution, interpreting the constitution, and that is their job as the Supreme Court, right? And so they made a ruling and then a week later, we have a president <laughs> And this isn't to, to pick on anybody, right? This is just what is happening and what is stealing our freedoms. We have a president who thinks he's greater than the Supreme Court by now coming out with an executive order to roll back or wanting to roll back. I don't know if legally he's going to be able to do so, but he comes out with a press conference and, and share uh, you know, this executive order to roll back what the Supreme Court ruled on. Now, Mark, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that imposes any risks to our freedoms? Uh, first of all, you and I are in the same place. You set it up, and I'm supposed to hit a home run grand slam and, and be at the park ballpark with you. And uh, that's true. I am in absolute opposition to what the president does with his executive orders because executive orders can't supersede this. It's called Supreme Court. And obviously, that's where I got the gold medal from. Judge Clarence Thomas is a Horatio Alger Award winner, one of 11. What happens is we have 10 Americans and one international every year. And, um, you know, that's the highest award you can get in business. So do I believe in our Supreme Court? Absolutely. Do I believe as as the founding fathers like Jefferson, like Madison, like George Washington, you know, put it together. And by the way, you have the best papers there. And one of the guys you got to have on your show here is, is in Boston, the guy who created Constant Contact is my friend Alex uh, Alex Stern. Um, the, the point is, he's got all the presidential papers there, and he's invited my wife and I to, he personally paid for them because he's done really excessively well. And he wants everybody in America to see him. So I'm, I'm hitting on those papers because that's what made America great. And unfortunately, what you're saying, even back to your statement, goes back to the educational system. We got to make sure the kids know why we have three branches of government. We're the only place that has it. We also because I own MarkVigrantsAndLibrary.com and we're a publisher, we're doing 
a book uh, on making sure you know what the difference, what you're talking about is dirty money versus clean money. We're doing a book called Dirty Money with with a wonderful guy named uh, Scott uh, Ford's, Ford. And and we're also doing a book back to the kids. Uh, when you and I were together last in, in Houston or, or time before last, sorry, we've been together three or four times. Yeah. What's amazing is this 14 year old kid came up to me and he was shaking and he had pimples on his pimples. His name is Devin uh, Woolwind and, and you know him. And, and yeah. he said, so what are you shaking about? So you're world's greatest, uh, world's best selling author. So you intimidate me. I said, just <laughs> calm down, breathe deep. I just work 18 hours a day. It's easy to be more successful, <laughs> be a little, harder and a little bit smarter, maybe. Anyhow, uh, long story short, he just did a book on, and I said, what'd you do? He said, at 14, I'm worth $843,000. I went, oh my God, what'd you do? He said, at eight years old, I passed a real estate test in Ohio. And then I, you know, made a little bit of money, bought my first $10,000 house. I now own 60. I was in a little brother, books with him because he want cause freedom. And, and maybe this, I'm looking at it from a spiritual point of view, because, you know, our book Ask, which says, ask yourself, ask others, ask God, is it? Is it ask God what's happening? Maybe we're going to have all these breakdowns so people see, hey, wait a second, we got to go back to the fundamentals that really work. Like if you want to keep your body alive, you got to eat. That's just a fundamental. And people say, right now we got idiot elitists saying, no, we don't need to feed people. We don't need this population. No, no, they're not God. God's God. And God says, look, there's fundamental abundance and we're going to do this right. We're going to have freedom. So the right people can do the farming, the right people can distribute the goods and, and the right people. But all that comes from one system only, free enterprise. I lived in India, I've been to Russia, I've been to China a lot. No system works. Our system is the only one that works. And even, I know I'm over answering your question, but Winston Churchill said about the three political systems, socialism, communism, or capitalism, capitalism got some foibles, some faults, some blemishes and tarnishes but it's the only system that really really works and that's why i'm so thankful you wrote freedom at risk thank you mark no i appreciate you we've had some great conversations uh i'm sorry uh your wife crystal couldn't join us today she's a wonderful person uh she's and, another and, podcast right now so i apologize oh no it's 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 all good we're all very busy people i appreciate you coming on um mark you mentioned the mark victor hansen library please give us a little soundbite on what you do there to help people at the library and then also how how people can find you good Everyone's got three choices, and I believe everyone has a story in them. Everybody has a message in them. Everybody has a book in them, an invention in them, an, an intellectual property in them, all that kind of stuff. Everyone has a way to make their fortune. And and so the three ways to do books, you can do it yourself. And I wrote a book called You Have a Book in You. You can go to a hybrid, which is what our company is, and you're doing a book with us. And number three, you can go to a major house. And I love the major houses. I'm not I, I'm with eight of them. I'm with Hay House. I'm with Random House. I'm with Health Communication. They all send me big checks. So I love them. But right now, because we've gone from 19,000 bookstores because of COVID confinement cocoon, which was politically motivated, we're down at 400 bookstores left. And I love the bookstores. I love the bookstore people. I love to read. I absolutely love to write. My parents were illiterate Danish people, so I'm a little more keen on this than most people. But uh, so we said, hey, wait a second. How do we get around and through and over this hurdle? Well, we created the Mark Victor Hansen Library where we co-author with the people. We charge them $29,900 now, and we give them both a book and an audio for their book. But And the reason is we need more stories. And, and back to what I said, if you want more freedom, you want more literature, more thinking, and more stories, uh, concretize in books. Because what's the first thing Hitler did, or Mussolini, or yeah. Stalin, or Mao, is they burn the books. You've all seen the videos, but you didn't say, well, that's going to affect America. No, America is trying to crush the book business. I'm going to do everything I can to build a new platform, build the books, build it into films, build it into docuseries. And, and yeah, you've written, you, Mark, have written 318 books, sold a half billion books, you know, a billion dollars worth of licensing. Yeah, but I did it because I knew how to read. I knew how to study. I knew how to think. And, and I'm standing on the shoulders of all the people that went before me. And I want everyone else stand on my shoulders. Right now, you've been with me standing when... I, I think we were sitting in, in uh, Houston uh, with Jason. He said, I'm going to outsell you. I said, good. That's the goal. <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, when, when Roger Bannister ran a four-minute mile, the next week, 119 people ran it. Before that, nobody knew they could run it. And all of a sudden, he broke the ceiling. Well, I'm breaking the ceiling, or at least that's how I see it. Now, if, if somebody out there is going to write in a, a, underneath there and say, oh, you're full of crap, that's fine. 
I can handle it. That won't be the first criticism of that. <laughs> no, it's, it's it. No, it's 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 all good stuff, right? You've created you've taken action to create this library called the Mark Victor Hansen Library, and you're helping people who have a story in their heart or in their head actually get it onto paper. And you've helped me. Uh, and and we don't have it out yet, but you know, following Freedom at Risk, Freedom at Risk just got released today, so folks can go on Amazon and buy it now. But right behind it, Mark has is helping me. We're in the process now of creating a second book, a fiction book called Nightingale, uh, which will appeal to a different type of reader, right? Because this message is so important. We want to get it out to many, many, many people, right? Uh, as I said earlier, um, and whatever way we need to do that, we're going to do that, right? So, Mark, thank you so much for helping me with the second book called Nightingale. It's part of the Savannah Valley series of books, and Mark is doing a, a, a fantastic job with that series. And uh, we have some rock star names in terms of uh, some of the other authors, so I'm just blessed to be, I'll say, coming along for the ride because you guys are all rock stars in my eyes. So, uh, Mark, uh, any any parting uh, comments? Well, listen, I'm just thankful to be on your show. I'm thankful that you are extending and elevating freedom to back where it's got to be because everyone deserves to have freedom. And I'm talking about 8 billion people concurrently alive. And there are a lot of people that want to say, I want to have control and I want to have power. Every one of them comes out of scarcity. Basic economics comes out of scarcity. If they'll watch my videos on YouTube or read any of my books, I come out of fundamental abundance because God said, I am here that you may have abundance and have it at, at freely. And the point is, I, I'm transliterating. It's not exactly the way it was said. John 10, 10 says, I have come that you might have life and have more abundantly. The point is, every spiritual system comes out of abundance. The Upanishads, when I lived in India, out of abundance, he or she took abundance, still abundance remained. Well, abundance of freedom. And right now, today, the telescope, as you know, just came back the NASA telescope. And for the first time, we're able to look 14 billion years into space. I mean, we're in the most exciting time if we release the political uh, myopia, the political ignorance, we throw off the blinders and go towards replete, complete freedom individually, collectively, politically, spiritually, and emotionally. Very eloquently said. Mark, thank you so much for coming on today. I so thank appreciate you, you my friend. And uh, I'm going to be down in Arizona in a couple of weeks, and I'll look you up and connect for lunch or dinner whenever you guys aren't busy doing great things. All right. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Looking forward to meeting all of you at one of the seminars that Tony and I will do in the future sometime. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. All right. That was amazing. Mark is such a giving individual. Him and his wife, Crystal, they are just so beautiful. I can't say enough good about them and the help they've provided me, um, you know, just with clarity of thought and talking through these things. Right. So um, Mark Hansen, everybody. Amazing man. So uh, our next guest is Ashley Ditello. She uh, without Ashley, uh, this book, Freedom at Risk would ne would have never seen the light of day uh ashley thank you so much for joining us today well thanks for having me on <laughs> and thanks this for letting me participate in the creation of this book yeah th this was uh I i'm sure you wanted to you probably wanted to uh delete my email many times and hang up the phone on me many times uh we've had uh we've had some good conversations uh, about this book and through this book. And you know, better than anybody, right? My goal with creating this book has always been to add extreme value to the reader, right? Um, do you think we achieve that? I do. Yeah. I, for me, as a reader, I've gotten a lot of value out of the book. And it's something I've never, I mean, I've helped a lot of people publish their books, but this is the one that I'm like, I want everybody to read this book. Everybody needs to read it. <laughs> Excellent. No, I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, in today's time and place, I mean, do you think um, this book is coming out at a good time and in, in, in a time when our freedom is at risk? Do you, what do you see happening out there? Do you think it's good timing for this book? Yeah, I think it's 
never been more important to be sharing this message because uh, I know I see all these articles out there about the millennial generation, which is the one I come from and how, you know, we, we, I was in college when the, the great recession hit, the great financial crisis hit and, and then with COVID and all these things. And I remember, you know, being in a position where I thought I'm never going to be able to own a home. I've been, and trying to help my parents understand like, oh, my circumstances are totally different than what you grew up with or what you had when you were just starting out. And, um, and so for me being able to learn uh, those principles of, of how to create wealth and protect it and, um, uh, and, and personal freedoms and all these different things, especially with where, I remember leaving, I left the country uh, in 2009 for a while, and I just read, uh, finished reading the book, um, The Road to Serfdom, and I remember looking around and thinking, I don't know if I'm going to come back to the same America, and um, and so I just, I, I feel like America is changing so much from from what I was taught in school and, and what I studied in college and the, and the foundational principles of government. And, and so what you talk about in the book, it's so crucial to, well, and I, and I love the point that you bring up that it's, we can't fix it all. We can't fix these problems, but we can take action to protect ourselves, to protect our own personal freedom and our, our own financial freedom. And, and that is so empowering because if you look at that first section of the book and you only look at that first section, you're going to think oh, this system's so messed up. We're all doomed. <laughs> but when you get into the second half of it, it's just this liberating thing. It's for, it's freeing. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and exactly. Wow. Just, uh, very well said. Um, and, uh, we, Ashley and I together, we labored over this book back and forth, back and forth every single day for, I don't know how long, um, making sure that we weren't writing doom and gloom, right? We did not want this book to come across as the sky is falling, chicken little, whatever, right? We wanted this book to come across very much as fact-based and hope and opportunity, right? We wanted to spread that hope and opportunity. And like Ashley said, you know, right, uh, regardless of the world, you know, doing what it's going to do. Um, and it's going to do stupid. Our politicians are going to do stupid. The education system is going to do stupid, right? Um, regardless of that, there are things we can do, <laughs> but it's a incumbent upon us to go do them, right? And so we talk so much about those different ideas to create personal and financial freedom. And so, Ashley, uh, was there one in particular, one action or one idea that you resonated with most uh in terms of creating either financial freedom or personal freedom for yourself oh uh, well they're all of them but um one in particular just i just got off some calls this morning i'm going to be putting into action your free year two or two year free money plan yes um, excellent and, and honestly i I feel like it's been such a blessing to be able to work on this book because if I hadn't been doing that, I would not have been able to identify the opportunity. Like you talk about in the book, identifying risks and opportunities. And, and because I've been so, uh, I love what you said. It was in one of our comments and as we were editing that you and I were doing the equivalent of passing that, that weight to that, uh, Oh, what is the exercise ball back and forth? To yes, each other. medicine, medicine ball. Yeah. Thinking. <laughs> yeah, our critical thinking skills. Um, if we hadn't been doing that, I, I honestly would have missed this opportunity to uh, to invest in this property and and understand how it would work and all the all the things that would go into it. And so I I love the the real estate uh, advice that you give throughout the book. And, and I liked that when we talked about, it, you said, I don't want this to be all about real estate, but you do pull on all of this great advice that you have in the real estate uh, field and being able to see that and how it plays into freedom. Um, that has been a huge blessing for me to be able to, as we sell our home, find, find a new opportunity. 
um, yeah. to continue protecting and growing our, our financial freedom. Yeah, no, that that's excellent. Thank you for sharing that story. And I'm, I'm glad, you know, um, you know, the book has helped you, you know, personally. Um, yeah, I definitely didn't want the book to be overwhelming in terms of real estate advice. Uh, although that that is my business. That's what I do. That's how I became, you know, uh, was able to retire at 44, be financially free and pursue my other interests, which to me, being able to have the time, right? Have time means freedom. I have freedom to spend my time the way I want, and I have freedom to think and do activities that I want to do. So for me, that's that's a big uh, way I define freedom. And so, uh, but that real estate isn't for everyone, right? And I realize that. And so, yeah, that's why we've, man, we labored over all these many, many sections just in the financial freedom section, so many different ways to create financial freedom for yourselves, you know, understanding, you know, um, uh, creating a business, starting a business for yourself, how that can create financial freedom for yourself and per personal freedoms in terms of, you know, you can work from anywhere, right? You don't have to work from, you know, your, your home or your business, you can work from anywhere. And that's uh, an extreme amount of freedom just right there. Um, so we, we go through all these ideas on financial freedom, but then above and beyond that, we talk about personal freedom and how you can create personal freedoms for yourself. And again, we just labored over all those things because, you know, we didn't want this to be something like, oh, okay, you have to do step one and then you do step two and then you do step three. We didn't want it to be like that. We want you to almost choose in a, in an all our cart fashion to say, oh, I resonate with this piece of advice in terms of financial freedom. Let me go do that, right? If you want to start a business or if you want to go invest in stocks, bonds or crypto or precious metals, you can go do that, right? Whatever resonates with you, you pick from that a la carte menu. And then the same with personal freedoms, right? Personal freedoms, we talk about um, earlier, I mentioned creating a backyard car garden for yourself. If you resonate with that, you pick that off the a la carte you know, menu in the book and you go do that. Or if you resonate with, uh, like I do, uh, getting a second uh, citizenship for yourself. So you have greater personal freedoms. You don't have to be, you know, so to speak, uh, stuck here in the US. You can go to another country and be able to enjoy your citizenship and your, and your freedoms there, right? You have that flexibility. So if that resonates with you, you pick that off the a la carte menu. This is not a one size fits all or a get rich quick scheme. It is just, uh, you know, a plethora of ideas that people yeah. can pull on. Um, so thank you for helping me organize all my crazy thoughts. Um, uh, you folks who are watching, you have no idea what poor Miss Ashley has had to deal with over the last year. Um, but Ashley, I, I truly appreciate all that you have done for me. I can't thank you enough. And for anybody out there who has a business, has a website, has, you know, something where they want to create content for their, their website, their social media, their newsletters, if they have a book, uh, that they want to get published and need editing done on it. Uh, that's all stuff that Ashley can do. So Ashley, if any of the viewers out there need you, what's the best way for them to find you? Um, I'm still getting my website up, but it is live. It's dayteyopublishing.com. Um, Teyo is just like hello, but with a T, uh, T E L L O, Dayteyo Publishing. Um, and we're also on Facebook. We'll be getting our other social medias up. I've been <laughs> spending so many years helping other people do their websites and socials. I haven't done my own. So, um, where it's, it's coming. So you can look for, look for it. But yeah, I, I've just so enjoyed working with you and, uh, when my I thrive on being able to help people get the ideas that are in their mind and make them even clearer on paper than than it even was in their head. And um, it's just been an absolute joy to work with you because you are so positive and uh, <laughs> just all the goodness, all the goodness that has come out of this, as you often said, I just love um, just working with you and this message that you're sharing. So thank you.
thank you, Ashley. You're 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 wonderful, truly. I I appreciate you in in so many ways. You've been so kind to me, uh, and and I know I haven't been uh, all that great <laughs> in terms all of in terms of uh, our many conversations. I I know it's kind of like no, this is what I want. This is how I want the book to read, right? And and so I'll share one one funny story. And and I know we have our next guest teed up here, but one funny story that I need to share. So uh, I had mentioned that uh, I had identified the book in terms of a specific chapter for education, then a specific chapter for society and culture, another one for politics, another one for um, the economy, and then another one for um, the monetary system. And so one day, Ashley comes to me and she says, you know, the economy and the monetary system, that's kind of like all in one. And let's just combine these into two chap and into one chapter. And man, <laughs> I, I apologize, Ashley, if I like came at you strong. <laughs> but I was so adamant of us needing to keep those two chapters separate because they both tell a very important story. And uh, does that make sense now, Ashley, why we kept those two chapters separate? Oh, definitely. Well, and as an editor, I've got to have tough skin because I I get paid to tell people what's wrong with, <laughs> with what they're doing. So if, I have, if I'm going to dish it, I've got to be able to take it too. <laughs> um, and, I, and I loved that because by the time by asking that question and you coming back to me and saying, no, it's important because of this, 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 and this, I was like, oh, well then let's, let's communicate that in the book and, and make that clear. So that conversation made, made that chapter even stronger because we were able to, to show the reader why they were two se why they needed to be two separate chapters. And, and by the time we got done working on, it, I was like, of course it has to be two separate chapters. Look at all these things we've talked about. <laughs> So yeah, I love that. We had a lot of fun writing this book. Uh, not that we didn't have our issues as we went through it, but it was it was truly with with uh, love in our hearts and the ideas in our head that we wanted to get to the reader to be able to help the reader understand why their freedoms are at risk and importantly how to protect their personal and financial freedom. So I think we achieved it, Ashley. We'll let the, we'll let the readers decide. Uh, hopefully, we get a, <laughs> hopefully we get all good comments on, on Amazon. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your time today and thank you for your help on the book. Thank you, Tony. Excellent. Wow, Ashley, you, you, you folks have no idea, poor Ashley, what I've put her through over the last year. She is truly wonderful. She's a wonderful person. And uh, so uh, keeping on that theme, uh, wonderful people. My next guest is, gosh, an, I am so, I, I'm really blessed. I am surrounded by such wonderful people. And I'm not just saying that, um, you know, I, I, my friends and family know me. Um, you know, I pretty much, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, kind of did my thing, got my job, you know, you know, head down, did my thing as a good citizen. Uh, but the folks that are around me are truly lifting me up. They give me energy. They help me in so many incredible ways. And that's one of the things I work to get across in, in this book, Freedom at Risk as well is to look at your surroundings look at your network look at your influencers and use them leverage them have them help you uh, that's what you know people are around you for is to be able to help you lift you up and i'm so blessed that today i have with me uh jennifer costanza who has helped me in so many ways uh jennifer welcome thank you tony i am so excited you see my t-shirt Yes, I love it. I love it, baby. baby. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes, Jen and I are uh, are both freedom seekers. Uh, we love our freedom, and uh, yeah, we are. We we have some healthy conversations uh, sometimes. But uh, first and foremost, um, so the the uh, the viewers understand. So Jennifer does. Uh, business consulting, right? She has her consulting company, JC Business Consulting. And Jen has been helping me 
over the last year plus to help me uh, organize, grow, figure out my business, right? And she's been such a rock star uh, in my world, helping me um, just kind of figure things out and just having, so, having her as, as a sounding board for some of my ideas uh, has been so valuable, right? And so, um, Jen, one of the things I talk about in the book, Freedom at Risk, is about who, not how, right? Um, and I have that book in the background here. Yep. It's written by Dan Sullivan, Who Not How. Um, I know my marketing team is probably going to ping me for <laughs> for showcasing someone else's book instead of my own. But uh, Who Not How, for the viewers, I think that's extremely important for them to know. Uh, in terms of you know, creating a business and creating wealth and freedoms for yourself, Jen, from your perspective, help, help us understand the importance of who, not how. Well, the who who got me into my business was Ken McElroy. He was the one that suggested uh, due to some some the point that I was at my life, said, you know, why don't, why don't you try this? Why don't you do it? I'll be your first client. Let's let's do this. And nice. I did. And of course, the who turned to this other who and there's and there's who is everywhere. Look at where you and I are right now. It's, you know, how is great, obviously. I mean, you know, your strengths, your abilities, but you kind of live in that bubble then. Yeah. If if people don't know if you and I hadn't connected, you know, yes, it's been great that, you know, that you found me helpful. But look at look at what we're doing right literally right now yeah it's because of who not yeah. because of 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 the how at all yeah yeah i think a, a lot of folks get stuck on the how and I, i've been there right i've been there i think everybody's there at some point in their life you know um we and i think to a great extent it's through the education system is uh teaching us we need to know how to do everything, right? How to do the math the right way, how to, you know, uh, you know, uh, write a sentence with, you know, the perfect grammar or whatever it is, right? You know, and sure, to, to a degree, that's all important stuff, right? Uh, I, I'm not, you know, don't mean to diminish uh, that. We need to know how to, how to do math and how to write a complete <laughs> sentence, uh, you yes. know, but, you know, that training, you know, extends into our lives, our personal lives, such that, it's ingrained in us that we need to figure out how to do everything. And uh, once you um, figure out you don't need to know all the hows and you can leverage the who's in your life, that is so liberating. You yes. just enter into a world that is just, wow, the, the, the world is your oyster, right? Yeah, and yeah. yeah, I agree completely. Yeah. And so you just through that, through that now understanding how you can pull on the who's in your life, mm -hmm. it's, it's liberta liber liberating and then also helps you getting back to freedom at risk. It helps you achieve greater freedoms, right, in your life. Right. So uh, it could be financial freedoms or personal mm -hmm. freedoms, what have you. Right. So. You know, you deal with a lot of folks who are in business, obviously. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of good conversations with these uh, very smart people. Um, do you folks see freedoms being at risk today? Yeah, and I think the reason why they're at risk, and hopefully this is how I can help and your book can help, is education. I think it's at risk sometimes by our own doing. You know, just because you are in X business or this business, you may not know about employee relations or HR or whatever it might be. And if you don't leverage those who's, if you don't understand and be really honest with yourself and say, this is not my bag. I have got to go to my network. I have got to figure out who can help me. So I don't put this at risk. Mm. You know, do, do I have the right uh, entity formations? Do I have the right documents for when I'm hiring employees? I think it's not it's not glamorous, certainly by <laughs> by any means. But, you know, keep yourself educated and aware of what's going on. So you're protecting whether, like you said, it's your financial freedoms or your personal freedoms, your freedom of time, freedom to do whatever it is that you want. And you're not distracted. 
And that's also what happens. You can put your freedom at risk if you're not keeping on top of those things. You and I are not tax advisors. Nope. I mean, I can barely balance my checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> I want nothing to do with those things. So I make sure that someone else is taking care of that so that I can maintain my business and what I should be paying attention to so that I'm keeping my freedom nice and neat as best as possible. Yeah, excellent. No, you're, you're knocking it out of the park, Jen. Um, so in terms of, you know, in terms of achieving freedom, do you think, do you see having a business is a good way to achieve freedom? I, I can't see the other. Like when I think about being an employee, mm. I can't imagine it. I can't imagine it because for me, you know, like we're talking about, you know, uh, financial freedom versus maybe more that personal side of it. And I mean, of course, growing my business, growing my own personal wealth is certainly important, but the ability to have that freedom of time and flexibility, uh, it's immeasurable. Hmm. It is just immeasurable. You cannot put a dollar to it. You, you, you just can't. It's just so uh, freeing. Talk about freedom. It, it yeah. is in and of itself freeing. Yeah, I guess I don't, I don't know how else to say it. The, the joy that it that it personally brings me and most of the people that I know, you are a joyful human being. Um, the other business that uh, owners that I've come into contact with, they love their business. They love their life. They love what they do. Uh, ups and downs, of course, of a business. But overall, I've not found one person that ever said to me, man, I'm going to shut it down and just go work <laughs> eight to five. It just it doesn't. As um, as a friend of mine once said, I am now unemployable yes. business owner. I, 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 I just I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You, you are you're you're so right. Um, I for many years, for 19 years, I worked as a W-2 employee. And for the viewers out there, I'm, I'm not knocking it. Right. Mm -hmm. If you work a job that fine, you know, uh, you're you're doing what needs to be done, you know, what Jen is sharing is is gold in terms of if you have the ability to liberate yourself from that W-2 job, and I'll share how I did it. Um, it's it's in the book. It's in some of my bonuses, but I'll, I'll give you a hint. I won't give away, away all the secret sauce, so to speak. <laughs> um, but uh, it is extremely liberating when you can, and you can imagine this, right? If you are to ditch the W-2 job and now you have all this time on your hands, how freeing is that going to be? Huge. That's going to be hugely freeing for you, for yourself, right? And it gives you now the time to go do what you want to do, what your passions are. And it makes you think, right? I have all this free time. What are my passions? Because as you go day to day working your W-2 job, I mean, again, it's, 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 it's okay, but you're not having these thoughts about living your life to the fullest, right? Having what I call a, a full life, right? Getting a great return on your life, right? The, these are terms I use in the book because I want each and every one of the viewers out there and, and the folks who buy the book to be able to have a full life and a huge return on life. And by having a W-2 job, that can be limiting. So having a business, transitioning yourself over time doesn't have to happen have to happen overnight. It didn't for me, right? In terms of transitioning from the corporate world to my real estate business, right? It took me 10 years to do that, right? Mm -hmm. 10 years, right? I started one building and then I built a couple of houses and then I went on to another building, right? You know, that's how I did it, right? To be able to create a greater freedom for myself. It didn't happen overnight. And I don't want anybody to have an expe expectation uh, that, you know, and we mentioned it before, this is not a get rich quick scheme mm -hmm. book or anything like that. Um, we're, we're trying to educate and transition folks to, to a better place uh, that they're going to be enjoying life more. Um, yeah. So, 
Yeah, thank you for helping us understand all of that, Jen. Jen, you've done a tremendously good job, uh, you know, for me, knocking it out of the park uh, with your consulting services. So JC, business consulting. Jen, if folks need consulting services or any help with their business, where can they find you? Super simple, I hope, is jcbusinessconsulting.com. That's easy enough. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Jen, thank you so much for coming on. We truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be with you today, Tony. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So that was Jennifer Costanza. She is such a sweetheart. God, I love her. She's helped me in so many different ways. Um, you know, not just, uh, you know, business consulting, but also talking through some of these different ideas on freedom and how we need to protect our freedoms and just the encouragement that I've received from her um, to be able to keep going because not, not every day is, is a easy, fun day. Um, it's work, right? And to be able to bring all of you uh, this, this book that took more than a year to create along with all the, the free bonus materials that have been created uh, and you can reach those on the website freedomatriskbook.com you can check those out all those bonus materials um you know we're giving that for free when you buy one three or five or more books right there's different levels uh of bonus materials that you can get so um i was just sharing it with with somebody how if you buy three books and and I'm not a salesman. <laughs> I do this uh, very, very poorly. Uh, and you'll see that as a, <laughs> when it comes across. Um, but I was sharing it with somebody that, you know, you can buy three books. And along with those three books, you will get a digital copy of the first three chapters of the book while you're waiting for your book to arrive from Amazon or whatnot, right? So you get a free digital copy of the first three chapters. You get a video for me on how to be rich and free, right? That I created uh, that walks through three different um, things you need to do to be rich and free, uh, right? So uh, I've created that video. Uh, I've created a companion guide and workbook uh, that goes along with this book that helps you answer some questions and think through more of this stuff on your own. So I've created that and offer that up free. Uh, when you purchase a book. And then uh, when you purchase three books, you get all that. Plus, you get a 30-minute consult with yours truly. Um, so uh, all of that, three books, plus all of those things, you get for less than $66. And I don't know. I think that's tremendous value. Uh, I see many, many programs out there that are thousands of dollars. Uh, so being able to buy those three books, plus get all those um, uh, free bonuses with the purchase of three books, uh, you get that for less than $66. I, I don't know. I don't know where my head was when I created that. Um, but yeah, that's extreme value for you folks. Uh, so enough of that. Uh, next on our guest list is... Uh, such a solid man I've come to know over the last year. I'm, again, I'm just so blessed by the people I get to uh, come across and the people I get to spend time with. Uh, his name is Sean Conley. And uh, so, Sean, welcome. I think you're on mute, my friend. No, I'm here. Hey, good to see you, Tony. Excellent. Uh, Sean, uh, you've been traveling this journey with me for the last year. We met out at a conference in Houston, I believe. Uh, we connected on, on such a fantastic level. And uh, why don't you share with the folks a little bit about what you do in terms of, you know, this, this company that you've started, uh, Five Stone Strategies, and then also take us into how that helps people protect their personal and financial freedoms. So uh, the company I just recently started uh, with my partner, Curtis, is uh, Five Stone uh, Strategies. What we do is uh, we take a look at your portfolio assets. And when I say this, it's talking about your family, your business, your lifestyle. And we take a look at that. And from a contingency perspective, um, we look into helping you develop a plan to protect those, not on the financial side, but on the um, you know contingency side. So we help set up contingency uh, continuity of operation plans for you and your family. And the continuity of operations plan is things like 
hey, if I got to move my business or if there's some sort of disaster and I want to keep it going, how do I do that? Examples, if you have a hurricane like in Louisiana, where I grew up, hurricanes were you know pretty constant. And if somebody had a business that was run out of New Orleans or South Louisiana somewhere and a hurricane's coming in and you're, you know, the power's out, there's a disaster going on for a month. How do you keep that business running and, and, and is successful? And, and that's what a continuity of operations plan does. But it also works for your family as well. If, you know, there's some sort of disaster, if, the, if there's riots, things like that, you want to get your family out of town, but you don't want to disturb whether it's their education or their planning or their life as uh, little as possible. It's, you know, and it might be locally a few, a few miles away you have to move to or to temporarily move them to another country. It depends on yeah. where you are and, and the situation. So that's what we, we help plan with. Look at that lifestyle and how to keep it going. Absolutely. Um, and I love the fact that you you folks, uh, you and Curtis help folks from not only a helping achieve that for businesses in terms of continuity of operations, uh, but also you go in and you help families understand what their personal atmosphere is like and what they would need to do uh, to uh, protect themselves, right? Which ultimately means protecting their freedoms, being able to have things in place to, to continue living the lifestyle in a free way that they've grown accustomed to. Uh, because you've seen, you've been all over this world. So your previous life, uh, you were in the military uh, for, for many years. Uh, you were a, a lieutenant colonel with the U.S. Army. And so uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for your years of service there. Uh, Sean and I have known each other, like I said, for uh, greater than a year now. He shared some personal stories with me. He shared pictures and videos with me. He is very, a very accomplished individual, uh, very knowledgeable individual, uh, very worldly individual. He's been all over the globe, right? He's seen what freedom looks like. Uh, and probably more importantly, he's seen what freedom doesn't look like. And so that's why we, uh, he and I resonate on such a high level. Um, Sean, one of the things I want to talk about is community and how community can help protect your, your personal freedoms. Can you help me understand that or help our viewers understand how community can help protect our personal freedoms? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think your, your, your book freedom at risk helps, you know, people understand that from a business perspective in the sense that, Hey, you know, when, when we're talking freedom, it's not an individual sport. It's not, yeah. you know, you're not going to go out there and, you know, you know, be Jeremiah Johnson and be in the mountains and live by yourself. It's just not practical for 90% of people uh, for life. So what it is, is it's a um, it's a community effort. It, it has to be a community effort. And if you saw a lot of these uh, villages and, and some of these places where I went, you'd have this major totalitarian rule going over the nation, um, whether it was, you know, Afghanistan with the, the Taliban or you had, you know, um, in some of these countries like Pakistan, others. You'd have this almost a totalitarian regime at the at the major city level, but the small villages almost seem free when you meet the people and local because the locals had a continuity, hey, this is what we'll accept and it's what we won't. And even if they sent, you know, the military police to try and force that, the locals band together and kind of said, no, you're not. And mm -hmm. I mean, there's entire regions of in the world in, in some of these totalitarian countries that are free, even though they are not, you know, considered that from a world only perspective. So what it is, is it's understanding your neighbor. I mean, that's one of the biggest things that we've lost in our country is understanding your neighbor. They, I mean, whether they have a BOM sign or a Trump sign, that, you know, most of the time, the majority of what they have in their heart is is a desire to be free and to take care of their family. And so yeah. just getting to know them at that level helps you understand they're not your enemy. They're your friend or at least, you know, majority of people are. And then from that, you can build relationships and build that community that that defends the freedom, but also provides for one another in the sense of, you know, that's that's one of our biggest assets for freedom. And this one, one of the things that's been lost in our country is. People depend on, on each other at that level instead of depending on the government. And when you get that, when you depend on each other instead of the government, then you really truly have a, a free community. You're you're absolutely right. And I'll I'll share a couple of personal stories. Uh, so relative to community and, and neighbors. Um, and this is totally unscripted. Sean and I did not rehearse this at, <laughs> at all. So I have no idea where it's going, but um, hopefully to a good place. Uh, so my neighbor is uh, polar opposites of where I am on the 
political scale uh, to the point, and it doesn't matter. I, I still love them. They're still good people. Um, I would still help defend them if they weren't in a bind. Um, they have certain political signs that they like to put at the end of their driveway, which is fine. Hey, it's their property. It's They can do as they wish. That's freedom, right? I don't have to agree with those signs, but that's what freedom looks like, right? They have the choice to do that. Well, one morning I get a text from her, from the wife, saying, you know, hey, did you guys hear anything last night? Uh, all of our signs have been run over, damaged, torn up. Somebody uh, did did some bad stuff. And so, no, I didn't hear anything. So the conversation, you know, kind of went on and um, it ended up with me sharing with her that uh, don't worry, uh, we have guns. If anybody was to, you know, come around to harm us, to hurt us, I got your back. We, we can, we can take care of this, right? Not that we would go shoot and, you know, hurt anybody, you know, willingly. But the message was, we're a community here. I, at the end of the day, we're humans. We have to help each other. Regardless of your political affiliation, we have to be a community and survive and uh, get get through this. Uh, so uh, I think that experience, even though it was a bad experience on her end that her signage was, was damaged, um, I think in some level, having that community where somebody who maybe she didn't expect it from me, I don't know, uh, who would being on a polar opposite end of the spectrum from her politically, uh, still felt reassured that if something was to happen, she could still turn to me and we could work this through as a community. So, uh, that was one story, uh, in terms of me building a community around myself. And then also I'll go back to the garden. Um, you know, uh, with a previous guest, I'd shared, uh, you know, uh, the fact that we have a garden, uh, it's, it's growing and expanding and we end up with more stuff than we could ever consume. So, uh, we give this stuff to, to our neighbors and that's one of the things that helps to create a community, right? Um, I could, uh, throw it out. I could let it raw. Um, I, I'm not going to consume all this stuff. Uh, so what better way to create community is to give some some of your lettuce, some of your vegetables, right? Your tomatoes, right? Uh, tomatoes, when they come into season, they seem to uh, come all at once, right? And you cannot consume uh, all those all those tomatoes all at once. So we give them away, right? Uh, and it's such a nice thing to be able to create that relationship with your with your neighbor. So um, I just wanted to share those two personal stories. So uh, Sean. Um, what are some different ways people can protect their personal freedoms? You know, whether it be, you know, creating a stockpile of food, um, you know, what, what are some different ideas that you share with, with your clients? I think the first thing that you need to do is just understand, kind of take a stock in what you're willing to give up and what you're willing to take at risk. And, and when I say that, you know, the, the Benjamin Franklin quote was maybe whether you talk to it, I got a context or not, the, the, the original Benjamin Franklin quote, the one that's always quoted now is, you know, those who give up liberty or, you know, for security deserve neither. And I think that's that's part of your thing is you have to understand what you're what you're willing to give up in cost. Um, and so when I when people are preparing, it's like, OK, you know, I might have the freedom right now to go to, you know, the grocery store or I want to live in the big city. I want to live in New York. I recently talked to a potential client the other day who's like, hey, we love New York City. We love we love it. We've grown up in Manhattan. But and most of my family is here, most of the uh, people around me. And the thing is, is taking stock and he's like, I, I just don't want to see my kids raised here with the way things are going. I'm afraid mm -hmm. if there's no something falls apart, there's no way for me to get out of the city. And so, you know, rather than, you know, he's willing to give up the lifestyle he has right now in order to move somewhere else, um, you know, to another state or and things like that. So he's looking at that potential. I think that's one of the things you have to just look at. And, and sometimes it's simple things like, hey, I just. I, I'm willing to give up not going to restaurants right now. And yeah. instead we're going to, we're going to put together some, start cooking at home, learn those skills. And so that way, you know, um, you know, my wife has really, you know, over the years learned a lot about, um, you know, um, it just, he's learned a very much a lot yeah. about getting the, uh, 
I guess she's one in canning. She's wanting to learn about how to cook bread, things like that. So things sure. like that where you can learn the skills where, I mean, if you have a big bowl of, of flour, what are you going to do with it? I mean, the majority yeah. of people in the United States have lost that skill set. I mean, yep. I, for yeah. me, I could probably make, you know, hard um, hard tack and coffee, you know, it was pretty nice <laughs> to live off that, but I don't think my family wants to live off that for the rest of their lives. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, some of this stuff we, we've we talked about, right? I've had you on my YouTube channel, uh, Dirty Boots Capital, right? Uh, so folks are learning, uh, wanting to learn more about the things Sean does. Uh, check out uh, the YouTubes he's done on my YouTube channel, Dirty Boots Capital. And so one of the things we spoke about is, you know, sometimes folks feel like, you know, they hear about these things and they get, you know, they get energized, which is good, but they think these things need to be put in place all at once, right? You know, oh, I need a pantry full of food. I need to have extra batteries. I need to have, you know, gas tanks stored. I need solar power. I need this. I need that, right? Um, these things don't have to be put in place like in day one, right, Sean? I mean, these things can happen over a period of time, and and that's what you've helped people with, right? I mean, is, yeah, no, is, I, I, no, that's the thing is, is you come up with a plan, then you prioritize the list. I mean, it's just whether you're renovating your home, whether you're starting a business, whether, whatever you're doing, you can't do everything at once, and it's just the way the reality of life is. But if you're starting something like this, you just have to put a priority list. What is your priorities? What is what is the things? And that's where helping to know your neighbors are. Because yep. if my neighbor is a great auto mechanic and can, you know, rebuild a car from scratch, you know, I yeah. I may not invest as much time into learning those skills because I can, you know, know my uh, my neighbor. And one of the things like my wife and I have chickens in our yard. And so we've really gotten to know our neighbors through every time we've got extra <laughs> eggs, we just knock on their door and say, hey, you want some eggs? And I'm giving away those eggs. But now we know who the mechanic is, who's the um, local neighbor who's, you know, got medical skills, who's the local neighbor who can understand, you know, carpentry. And so those type of things and provide those skills. And you might focus on, this is the one skill I want to provide my, my neighbors. It might be something yeah. you, a hobby of, you know, that you were really good at. I mean, uh, my wife, you know, is a lot more talented than I am. So she's a painter. So she's able to, you know, teach and she's a teacher. So she's able to teach kids, you know, artwork and she's able to teach, you know, um, and she's able to paint and do provide her talent to other people. And so, that's a skill set that she has that I would no way be able to accomplish. But, you know, it's, it's a valuable skill set for other people, especially the education piece. And parents, yeah. you know, are loving to have, learn teaching. So that's where uh, I think you look at it step by step and, and going back to your freedom at risk. I mean, you, as you, it's interesting because the Benjamin Franklin quote we talked about earlier is actually um, was re originally referring to taxes. And, mm. and giving up liberty by giving up, you know, not being willing to take taxes. And, and so when people think about it, economic freedom is what allows you to be able to have the time to, to build that skill set you want to build or to be able to build that stockpile you need to build or or build that community. Because yeah. if you're financially retired, then, you know, like you can reschedule your your day around being able to spend some time with your neighbors. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just having that freedom of time is so empowering. Um, and it's definitely one of the things, uh, we teach in the book and, um, you know, just going back to this, putting, uh, freedoms in place for yourself through, you know, you know, personal freedoms in terms of the sustainability piece that Sean comes to the table with and helps many families with and many businesses with, you know, for the viewers, uh, don't feel like you have to number one, go it alone, right? Don't go it alone. Right. Jen and I just on the last segment, we spoke about who, not how. Right. Don't try to figure out how to do all these things yourself. Go to the who that already has all the knowledge. Right. That's Sean. Sean and his partner, Curtis. They've done this many times over all over the world. So who better than to pull on Sean and Curtis to be able to do this from five five stone strategies. Right. So uh, that's part of it. And then the other part of it is you know, again, for the viewers, you don't have to create these, um, this personal freedom for yourself all in day one. Rome wasn't built in a day, right? We all know that. It takes time to put these things in place. So you first start small, you start with, you know, maybe having a pantry, fill in that pantry. Every time you go to the grocery store, you buy one or two or three extra items, 
to put in the pantry, right? And you grow from there. You know, like us, we started uh, with a small garden. We didn't have a, you know, a huge area. So we just started very small. Um, and then we grew from there. Um, and so maybe one day we're going to add some chicken and goats, right? Who Who knows, right? We have the ability to do that. And I think... One of the big things is, Sean, as we've gone along and we've learned from folks like you and others, you know, others in our community, we've also gained confidence in our ability to do some of these things. And so by taking action, which is one of the things we we try to help people work through in the book is, you know, if they haven't taken action, trying to help them understand why they haven't taken action. Right. And so we we do a deep dive in the book on on that to help people kind of like uh, figure that out for themselves, because for everybody, it's different on why they don't take action. Uh, but once you figure that out and you start taking some baby steps, uh, it, it does have a snowball effect. So the work you're doing, Sean, is is phenomenal. I can't thank you enough for for the help you're you're providing people for folks that you know, uh, want to seek you out for, for advice and for help, Sean, where can they go to find you? Uh, well, <laughs> sometimes it's tough. Uh, yeah. That's, um, the best way to reach me is, um, on my, um, email address, which is SMC eight, nine at protonmail.com. Um, that's the best way to reach me. Um, all right. And then we're on five some strategies, um, dot com is also our, our our website. So um, that mostly since we're, because of our nature of what we do, we really don't get online much um, or don't have a big online presence. But yeah. we do, um, you know, you can reach us through that and then connect with us that way. Absolutely. No, that's fantastic. And for any of the viewers, if for some reason uh, you cannot locate any of these guests uh, for whatever reason, uh, you can always ping me uh, either by sending me an email at Tony Lopes at dirtybootscapital.com. That's Tony Lopes at dirtybootscapital.com. Or you can just go to one of my websites, either, either freedomatriskbook.com or dirtybootscapital.com and shoot me an email or message from there. Okay. Yeah. So and hey, just uh, one thing to close, I definitely, you know, every, encourage everybody to go get that book, you know, Freedom at Risk because your those principles are, are there because like you said, it's, it's that freedom you're giving people financially, but also the freedom time-wise, which is the one thing you can't get back. And that that's that's the thing is you're training people to get that time that's so important to be free. So, hey, I appreciate all you're doing, Tony. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sean, for coming on today. I truly appreciate you, brother. All right. Hey, talk to you later. All righty. Bye-bye. All right. Sean is, is amazing. Um, you know, just a wonderful person, wonderful soul, just out there trying to help people uh, protect their personal and financial freedoms. Um, you know, in terms of providing that continuity of operation for businesses, uh, that's pretty important to protect their financial freedoms. And then just going into the communities and helping people personally um, by showing folks what they need to do um, in terms of, you know, uh, food preparedness or uh, security preparedness, right? That protects their personal freedom. So he's doing a fantastic job. So uh, thank you, Sean, again, for coming on. We appreciate it. Uh, up next, we have a, a, a an amazing guest. Uh, this, this is so wild. I met this young man at a conference uh, years ago. I think it's two years ago now. Um, he's a 19-year-old macro enthusiast, um, and he's doing some great things. So let me bring on Mr. Josh Lassard. Tony, uh, yes. It's Hi, only Josh. been about like five or six months, I believe, at like the Houston <laughs> Rebel Capitalist Live. <laughs> but it has been great meeting you. Yes, yes. No, thank you, Josh, for coming on. You are you are amazing. You're an amazing young man. However, uh, you are already so accomplished in terms of your thoughts and where you are in, in your thought system. So help people understand a little bit about what you do. I know you have your YouTube channel. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Uh, help people know a little bit more about who Josh is. 
Yeah, so right now I originally started working for George Gaiman, who's a massive in the macroeconomic space, and then branched off because I met George to some of his other friends. Like now I'm doing some work for Ken McElroy, and then I just started work for Doug Casey. So I'm just kind of uh, helping them out uh, with uh, the YouTube algorithmic purposes and as well as uh, doing research mainly on the macroeconomic scale. And so, and then you also have your own YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, because I'm already doing all the research for them. So why not just put them on my own channel? Uh, absolutely. Why? Why not? Right? Um, w why do you think? You know, you know. Shoot, you're you're 19 years old, right? Um, why? <laughs> as a 19 year old, I you know I was I wasn't thinking about these things. What? Why do you think this is important for you to be thinking about and and educating yourself on? I don't know. That's a tough one. I, I don't know. I, I think it's vital for people to want to know about this stuff. But if you don't really have the desire and the curiosity to kind of want to kind of understand what's going on around you, then there's really no reason why you would uh, care too much. But I just I care about freedom as much as any human on earth. And that's kind of the purpose of your book. So I, yeah. when you're stuck in your house during March of 2020, one, wondering like, like, why can't I go outside? You just start to get uh, thoughts that come to your head that have never come to your head before. And if you kind of keep going further down the rabbit hole, you kind of develop these libertarian minds for after reading like Atlas Shrugged or 1984 or any of these uh, great books, then I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it is vital for someone to, to want to know this stuff, but I think you have to kind of have that desire first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that desire gets fueled by what's happening in the world today when you do start to see some of your freedoms at risk, right? And so one of the things I share with folks, and I was just having a conversation about this, um, it's unfortunate, but people don't get educated. They don't take action to a large degree until it's too late. It's kind of like the, the, the leaky roof scenario, right? Um, the roof isn't a pro is not a problem until it starts to leak, right? And so they take action when it's too late, when the roof is already leaking. They're up there in the rain with a ladder, slippery conditions, trying to throw a tarp, trying to prevent the, the leak from getting worse, right? Um, that's too late. In terms of our freedoms being at risk, we don't want to be up there on the roof in these uh, in these situations when our freedoms are already at risk, right? We want to get in front of them. We want to be educated to, to some degree, right? Uh, Josh, I know you spend a lot of time, a tremendous amount of time on, on learning on what's going on in the world geopolitically and then economically and socially and education system-wise. You, you spend a lot of time on all those things. But, um, you know, for the average person, you don't need to. There's a lot of good uh, YouTube channels out there. You know, uh, go to uh, Josh's uh, YouTube channel. You're, you know, folks will get an education there. It's macro after dark, real, real easy, right? I got my YouTube channel where folks can poke around and look at different topics they're interested in, right? Uh, George Gammon is a wealth of knowledge, right? This is what he does. He does this all day long. Uh, if folks are interested in what's happening in the the crypto space. There's tons of folks out there talking about crypto, right? Uh, geopolitical space. There's folks with YouTube videos talking about the geopolitical environment, um, oil and gas or energy. There's folks, right? So you don't have to spend a tremendous amount of time like Josh and I do <laughs> researching these things. We have to a degree, we have a passion for these things. We, we love this stuff. Uh, but for the average viewer, the average reader, uh, you know, we summarize it in some of our videos to be able to distill it uh, into a format that folks can um, consume it in a bite-sized piece. Uh, so I appreciate what you're doing out there, Josh. Um, do you do you see uh you know as a 19 year old as a person who's been studying this for for a good amount of time do you see our freedoms being at risk today oh absolutely it's it's an absolute no no brainer 100 percent what and in, in what ways and what ways are are you seeing it take place well i mean you can't 
I mean, until recently, you couldn't go on a plane without wearing a face mask or you can't go to certain countries without getting certain medicines. Uh, you're now just seeing massive economic on uh, you see a ton of freedom being stripped away in economical stances as well as I was running a business throughout high school, but it was illegal for uh, people to not to run a business if you didn't have all your paperwork, if you didn't have an LLC and starting like an actual corporation. It just it's driving massive amounts of uh, wild inefficiencies that you would see in third world countries that are really just starting to develop just because uh, our freedoms are being stripped away one by one. And that prevents entrepreneurs or people just from living their everyday lives, benefiting society and actually creating wealth, which is goods and services. Yeah, it's this uh, this mentality of big government is good. You know, may maybe is how some people see it. Certainly the politicians see it as big government is good. Um, and it's a lot of propaganda that's in the system right now. Uh, as as I share with folks, it's it's people, propaganda and profit. Right. Those are the three things that are that are hurting our freedoms today. Now, people can come in the form of politicians, big government. Right. Things like that. People can also come in the form of corporations. And universities, right? And so those people are spewing a lot of propaganda uh, in the world um, that many folks are unfortunately blind to because uh, they've just been conditioned for so long. And so that propaganda allows these people, these companies, these universities to profit. And so once you start to see that, um, you become more in tuned to how your freedoms are being stolen, right? How they're evaporating. And so one of the things uh, we like to talk about is taking away some of that power from big government and giving it back to the states, right? Giving it back to the local communities, right? They are better positioned to be able to make decisions, right? You, you bring up the mask mandate, um, you know, and it came from big government that everybody needed to wear a mask. You know, however, where I am, we have many um, great uh, beaches and hiking trails and just such a great outdoor recreation environment. And I remember you had to wear a mask on the trails. You had to wear a mask at the beach. And it's like, there's there's nobody around me, right? There is nobody yeah. on the beach, you know? And so because it was big government mandating these things, right? It prevented the, the states from doing what was more uh, reasonable and uh, deciding for themselves at the state level what was, uh, what was just more, more practical. Uh, so we need to get away from this big government mentality. Um, you know, uh, you had said you had started a business back in high school. Um, and so you have to dissolve that because of the man. Um, <laughs> tell us about uh, why. I, I know you didn't go to college. You're, you're pers pursuing a different path. So why not college? Why, why didn't you go help maybe help our younger viewers or maybe there's some viewers out there with with children who are thinking about going into college. Give us your perspective why college was not the right path for you. Well, I saw a lot of people go through go to college everyone I mean every single parent their ideology was that you go to college to get a good job to then uh, live a relatively medium successful life where you just kind of have a middle class, a nice car and a nice family and a nice house. And you kind of just do the same thing every day. And that was just the way that life was supposed to work. But I just never wanted to live like that. I wanted to run a business and I wanted to make money. And I thought that was fine. I wanted to be a greedy capitalist. So uh, what I did was I found entrepreneurs that I wanted to work for, because if, if I wanted to run a business, I thought I should learn how to run a business from someone that has ran a business oppo opposing a college professor who has never ran a business or knows how to make money. So I just kind of apprenticed myself a lot like they would do uh, back in like the Gilded Ages where you, you would find a profession that you wanted, you would apprentice yourself, learn the skill, and then you would kind of do it on your own. So I'm kind of doing the, the same type of thing. No, that's 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 wild. And and I think it's wild for a 19 year old to be able to come up with that 
uh, that vision on their own. And so today you are uh, running around in, in circles with uh, very successful people, right? Kenny McElroy. Well, people like yourself, Tony, book, oh. book, book writers. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate you, Josh. Um, yeah. So, uh, but I want to give kudos to, you know, the, these great folks you're, you're hanging out with, right, Kenny? I, I, you know, we, we have the opportunity to be able to be surrounded by these great people, right? The, the who's in our life that have done it, right? To go back to that, you know, you're pulling on the who's to be able to help you um, in your life. And so, uh, you know, we get to hang out with Robert Kiyosaki on many occasions. Right. And that's, that's a lot of fun to get to know him at a personal level and be able to ask him questions. Right. Uh, so, uh, good for you for engaging in that way. Kim Kiyosaki, right. She's a very successful businesswoman, Right. And they're, they, uh, Robert Kiyosaki and Kim Kiyosaki, they go beyond, investing in just real estate, right? They have many, many other businesses that folks may not know about, but, uh, and that's part of the conversation. Why, Robert, why are you investing in this? Or why are you investing in that? Why did you start your business this way? You know, that's part of the education is to be able to um, surround yourself with these great people who have done great things uh, to be able to figure out what freedom uh, path you're on, okay? Uh, and then just thought leaders, like the George Gammons, right? Like the, the Doug Casey's and, and others that we get to hang out with. And the beautiful thing is some of these great thought leaders, uh, they're just trying to get us to think. They'll be the first ones to, and they've said them, they said it to me, right? I've had, you know, speaking with Brent Johnson, I use this, this example all the time. If, I, if folks don't know who Brent Johnson is, go seek him out. He's on uh, YouTube videos uh, all over the place explaining his uh, dollar milk, milkshake theory. Um, super smart guy, super smart. Um, and so I'll be having this conversation with him. I did. Uh, and he, and so we're going back and forth trying to understand these things. Uh, with the dollar. And he shared with me just such a, such a gentleman Brent Johnson is. He shared with me that, Tony, we're all just trying to figure this out, just like you guys, right? And just helping me wrap my head around the fact that even these guys, as smart as they are, as much experience as they have, they don't have all the answers either, right? They're trying to think through this, just like you and I, to be able to come out um, okay on the other side. And so it's just so reassuring and just, you know, heartwarming to hear folks like Brent Johnson and George Gammon and Doug Casey, others just kind of just share their thought process. They're not saying they're right. They're just giving their perspective. And I think that's super important for uh, us to try to spend some time with, with thought leaders like that. Uh, more so than just listening to what the politicians are saying, just listening to what the media is saying, right? Uh, there's certainly a slant to the media and to the politicians and what they're trying to sell us. Um, and again, it goes back to people, propaganda, and profits, right? So you got to be careful that with that piece. Um, so, Josh, for young people today... Um, what what type of advice would you give them on seeking out teachers or developing multiple income streams, uh, maybe investing in crypto? I know crypto is 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 hot with some some young folks or maybe investing in stocks and bonds, doing some uh, options trading uh, there. Give us some, uh, what, is, what is your advice on each one of those? Let's start with teachers. What's your advice there on seeking out teachers? I, I think that could be one of the most important things you can do. Because, I mean, if, if you, let's say, if, if you're running a business, you're going to make a thousand mistakes. But let's say if you, you could kind of jumpstart that, if you work for someone who's already run multiple successful businesses, instead of making a thousand mistakes, maybe you'll only make a hundred. And th then yeah. you'll, if you learn from other people, maybe you'll only make 50. So you need to kind of have that education firsthand from someone who's already done it. And that's just going to jumpstart your uh, success very, very quickly. Absolutely. You're, you're spot on there, Josh. Let's move to uh, multiple income streams. What advice would you give young people there? 
if you really want to make a lot of money, then you have to run a business. It, it, it would be very difficult if you want to be like a, a, a options trader, or crypto trader with what you're saying. Some people hit the lottery and they make a massive amount of money, but there is almost nobody who takes their personal portfolio if they're not managing other people's money and turns that into a way that they can live off that forever. It is extraordinarily rare. You need the income stream to invest in the stock market into these different asset classes that can then generate passive income through real estate or dividend paying stocks. And then that compounding effect allows you to make a lot of money. But if you just want to get rich, it would be very, very difficult to do that. So you would almost have to start a business to, to do that. You're, you're spot on, Josh. One of the stories I share with folks is um, a three-prong approach, right, to creating wealth and having a uh, all the personal and financial freedoms that you want is, number one, have real estate, income-producing property, right? Have real estate. Number two, second prong, have a, uh, have a business, like you're saying. Um, it's okay. Some folks are working a job today, a W-2 wage earner. Okay. But if you can work towards having a business, creating your own business, that is very important for your freedoms, right? And then third, it's getting into dividend paying stocks, bonds, crypto, precious metals, things like that to be able to create a multiple uh, a, a third income stream for you. So uh, having a business like you nailed there, Josh, is is super important. So that's good. What about crypto? What are your views on crypto today? Uh, I'm, I'm bearish short term, but long term, I'm an extreme bull, at least uh, philosophically. I mean, I 100% agree with everything that Bitcoin is trying to be. I'm not confident that it will be that. But if it does, you want to have a a piece of the pie. So currently, I don't really own any cryptos, but I do plan on positioning myself, uh, getting some Bitcoin, maybe a few percent of my portfolio, because if it does do what everyone wants to say that it's going to do, then that will be more than enough to kind of uh, take control of your your future finances. Absolutely. No, it's one of those things where, you know, you can't be putting the tarp on the roof when it's raining, right? It's too late, people, right? This is why we're trying to share why our freedoms are at risk so folks can get this education and start to take action in some small way, okay? When there's blood in the streets with the crypto market and folks are selling crypto, that may be the best time to buy, right? And like Josh is sharing, buy just a little bit, right? Create that little nest egg such that uh, when, when the fear and panic is over and things start to go up again, now you're creating wealth for yourself, okay? But you have to take action, right? Don't follow the pact, right? Create your own plan and uh, execute from there. Uh, like, like Josh is articulating here, like Josh has his plan. God bless him, right? And then lastly, Josh, help us understand where are you with the stock market? What are things uh, going to be doing there? Uh, well, I'm definitely not going to try and predict the future, but I... I... <laughs> I, I'm definitely bearish uh, shorter term again, even though we've already seen him a pretty steep decline. Just looking at long term charts, we're still wildly overvalued if we look at almost any indicator. So th I'm, I'm, I'm still but there's a, like that's just overall. Like if, if you look at individual sectors and some names are looking pretty attractive, but I'm still not really buying anything right now. But if, I mean, yeah. if I'm looking at, let's say, five to 10 years, I would love to own uranium, coal, copper, gold, silver, uh, shipping companies. A lot of these companies are doing extremely well for themselves, producing massive amounts of cash flow. And the, the policies that we were talking about earlier that are preventing people's freedoms from producing more goods and services look favorable, like the ESG movements that are preventing these companies from actually getting the metal out of the, the mm. ground, which is making it extremely favorable for prices looking forward. That doesn't Absolutely. mean I think that it's going to just go up in a straight line, though. Yeah, it's it's again, it's one of those things you have to create your plan, right? And we're, we're all doing it behind the scenes, right? We're all doing it. I'm looking at silver, right? Uh, if anybody's been looking at silver lately, it's been uh, going down. Uh, yeah. and down and i'm smiling and every day i, I yes I want exactly <laughs> guys like you and me josh we're just watching and we're saying yep uh we look at other indicators right because there's other indicators that will help uh i don't want to say predict the market but will give you a greater sense of probability of whether it's going to go up or down and so those are the things that josh is looking at that i'm looking at 
to be able to not necessarily uh, buy at the bottom because we'll probably never buy at the, at the exact bottom. Uh, but we look at those indicators to try to um, create wealth for ourselves by buying at what we believe is the uh, the most opportune time. So, uh, Josh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on each one of those. Uh, again, you are a wealth of knowledge. Uh, again, where can folks find you if they want to seek out more information? Uh, Macro After Dark is fine, either on Twitter, YouTube, whatever. Yeah, yeah, you have a great social presence there. Uh, Josh, thank you so much for coming on and helping the viewers understand why freedom is at risk and why we need to protect it each and every day. So thank you. Thanks for having me on, Tony. Uh, fantastic job with the book, and I'm uh, looking forward to reading it. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Excellent. Yeah, Josh is just an amazing young man, 19 years old. Can you believe it? Um, I certainly wasn't thinking about macro macroeconomics at 19. Um, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, he's he's amazing. Glad he was able to share with us his perspective as as a young person. Right. Uh, and that's one of the things I seek out is um, looking at all types of different demographics. Right. Young people, older people, uh, people who are retired, who have more experience than me, who are, you know, 60, 70, 80 years old to be able to help calibrate me on certain things, um, as well as young people who are, you know, really in tune to some of the new technology out there and this whole crypto environment and the metaverse, what the metaverse has uh, in store for us. OK, so it's important to kind of seek out those different types of uh, crystal balls to see um, what may be in store for us here and where that and what that means for your uh, financial and personal freedoms uh, and what you need to do there. So, all righty. Um, our next guest here is a, a man I know very well. Um, I'm very happy and very proud to have him on today. He's a great friend of mine. He's helped me on many occasions think through, gosh, so many things, uh, political issues, uh, macro economic issues, uh, societal type issues, um, just uh, really helped me immensely. Um, and uh, the reason why I want to have him on is because he is a Ukrainian American and uh, and if anybody knows the struggles for freedom today, it's the Ukrainians uh, going through what they're going through. So uh, I want to welcome on is a man by the name of Dmitry Nazarenko. Dimitri, Hi, Tony. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for joining us today. Pleasure to be here, Tony. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, you heard me share that uh, with the viewers here that you are a Ukrainian American. Uh, why don't you share, I know you have a lot of stories, why don't you share some of your experience, maybe some of your familial experience with uh, growing up in the Ukraine, not you personally, but them growing up in the Ukraine. Sure. Uh, little family history is that my grandparents, father, uh, uncle, and my mother's side of the family were repatriated to Germany during the war to work on farms because the German males were forcibly conscripted into the army and sent off to battle uh, the Russians primarily. And when the war ended, my grandmother's side of the family on my father's side, uh, they were brought over to the States. They were um, became citizens settled in Syracuse, New York, worked in the factories that were there. And uh, my father met my mother at church. They married, had four kids, and uh, we grew up and we were told to grow up as Americans of Ukrainian descent, meaning that my parents had a full expectation that we would integrate into American society and be productive. Hmm. Uh, Again, not forgetting where we came from, but understanding from my grandparents' side and my parents' side, there was really nothing left to go back to. Um, the Ukrainians were forcibly integrated uh, by the communists 
the farmers were all uh, grouped together into collective farms and uh, were forced to go to work uh, there. So uh, they didn't want to go back to that. And they much preferred living and working in the States. Yeah. Well, um, I've shared with you many times, you know, I probably would have been served better by getting a psychology degree than a engineering degree that I have. Um, <laughs> I've shared that story with you many times, but I struggle. No, seriously, I struggle with the fact that, you know, that it, what's happening now in the Ukraine didn't just start now. This has been for decades and decades going on. So I struggle with psychologically why some folks would still stay behind and risk their their personal freedoms to an environment like that. What, what do you think about that scenario? Well, it's really hard to leave the home that you grew up in or the area that you grew up in, the language, the religion, and go someplace completely foreign especially without a support system. Yeah. And so people were repatriated after World War II, or they stayed in Ukraine and hid in forests. Um, but others um, left. In fact, there's a strong parallel between uh, the Jews and Germany during that time. Many Jews saw the same signs as other Jews, but some stayed and some left. Einstein yeah. left, for example. He decided he was not going to stay in Germany. So people can be presented with the same information, Tony, and come up with very different conclusions. Do you do you think the folks that stayed behind in the Ukraine, do you think they felt like they had um, the ability at that time to protect their freedoms? Or do you think they were just... I don't know, go, going along for the ride because that's where their home was and that's that's the language that they knew, you know. But, I mean, do you think there was a, a thought process going on to say, okay, I'm going to stay here, but I need to do X, Y, and Z to protect my freedoms? Well, the challenge there is that uh, in that part of the world, uh, there has never been the kind of freedom that, say, we experience here in the States or in Western Europe. Uh, Ukraine started off as a monarchy or dictatorship, stayed that way till the end of World War II, and then they were overthrown by the Russians uh, during World War II. And so communism, or World War I, I should say, and communism replaced the dictatorships at that point in time. Um, gotcha. My, I'll never forget, <laughs> as a teenager, talking to my grandmother on the farm. She worked on a farm. And I thought it was the most boring job you could ever have. Working with animals, you know, the, the insects and the animals were always trying to eat your garden. And the dogs needed to be fed and the chickens. Need, you know, it, it was just, as a teenager, unbelievably amazing to me. And she told me something interesting. She said, there isn't another place in the world I'd rather be. Hmm. No one comes here and tells me what to think, what to say, who to say it to. They don't bother me here. As, and then she added, as long as I pay my taxes, nobody bothers me. <laughs> but of course, but of course, always got to pay your taxes. So that that's a very interesting story and a very personal story. So uh, thank you for sharing that one. Sure. It makes it makes me think. Um, do you think we in the U.S. Do you think we've been desensitized to what our freedoms are? I I believe so. Yes. Um, every government, Tony. Every government, whether it's a dictatorship, a communist, socialist government, very much wants to tell the people what to think and how to behave. Now, the dictatorships and the communist governments will enforce that at the barrel of a gun. Mm -hmm. Here, we um, we can't do you know we don't do that. 
-hmm. There's an old joke about an American diplomat meeting a Russian. And they were discussing personal freedoms. And the Americans said, I can go outside the White House and I can yell at the White House and say, the president is an idiot. Hmm. And he said, I can go to the Kremlin in front of the Kremlin, stand there and say, the American president is an idiot and they'll leave me alone. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> if he said the Russian president was in Egypt, yep. they'd be a different story. Way. Yeah. And so um, there's a certain segment of the population that likes to be dependent. Mm -hmm. They like um, they like being told what to do on a daily basis. They find comfort in that. Yeah. Uh, you, you can remember people at work, I'm sure, who thought that way. They'd come in and do the same job day in and day out. And then there are others. You put them in an assignment like that, and after six months, they're chafing at the bit, trying to get out and get up, go on to something else. Yeah. Uh, the people that, that chafe at the bit in Ukraine uh, before communism, or during communism, I should say, were executed or retrained. And... There's people in China, it's the same thing, that there's a million people working in uh, work camps. They're in work camps. Yep. And uh, we don't have that here. Yeah, unfortunately, um, what we do have is we, we have too many folks who are willing to, as I say, who are willing to give up some of their freedoms for free government cheese, right? And uh, that would be welfare programs, social programs, and they don't realize they're giving up some of their freedoms, right? And so, uh, so I'll I'll give an example. Uh, I can give a couple. Of, I can give many examples because um, <laughs> I have time to think about these things. But uh, you know, I'll I'll use you know a school shooting uh, as an example, right? Which is, uh, you know, we just had one here recently and. I believe it was Texas Uvalde, right? Uh, tragic, right? We'll all agree that was a tragic scenario, right? Yep. Um, and the first thing folks want to do is invite government in, big government, to fix their problems. Big government to fix their gun laws, uh, to increase regulation, right? To put you know, thicker doors on the building, more steel bars on the windows, right? A guard at the door, what have you, right? That's all inviting big government in to solve society's problem, right? Um, the fact that you do those things, it's, we all know that's not going to prevent guns getting into the hands of violent people, right? And if it's not a school, it's going to be a theater, if it's not a theater, it's going to be a church. If it's not a church, it's going to be a mall. Okay? So you see where this is going, right? So here we are. Uh, society does it to itself by inviting big government in to solve its problems, right? Instead of working to understand why the problem exists and working to, as a society, fix those problems for themselves, right? And uh, that's where I see people, um, you know, wanting more, trading their, their freedoms for more security in terms of big government, okay? And, you know, I'll go back to, you shared a personal story, I'll share a personal story in terms of, you know, uh, sticking with society, right? What I gave an, an example there where society expects the government to solve their problems. I'll go back a number of years when I was like six or seven years old. Uh, you know already, Dimitri, that my father was a construction worker. He was a laborer building roads and bridges, right? We didn't grow up with, uh, you know, silver spoon in our mouth, not at all, <laughs> um, right? So yeah. he was a construction worker. My mom, uh, she worked in a textile factory making curtains and belts and things like that, right? So she worked as a sewing machine operator. Again, not making a lot of money. It was a, I'll say, a, a cyclical job at best. Many times my mom would be so um, 
she had the option, my mom had the option to go to food pantries to collect free government cheese. I think there was only, or at least there's only one time, one time of us kids growing up, and, and there was four kids, right? So this was a family of six. There was only one time where my mother went to the food pantry to get the orange block of cheese, right? Uh, and I think it was a box of cereal and a thing of powdered milk, right? Why do I remember that? That's ingrained in my mind because she only did it once, right? And she only did it once out of necessity, absolute necessity, because all the other times, I'm sure she could have, because she was laid off, she could have, right? She could have gone get that free government cheese, sure. but she didn't because she had personal, uh, personal accountability and a pride about herself that she wasn't gonna succumb to needing the government to put food on the table, right? That's why they had a backyard garden. That's why they killed, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, rabbits and uh, um, goats and you know things like that to be able to put food on the table for for the family, right? Right. So you know, these days, um, you know, people are out of work and they're already there with the handout saying, "Give me my free government cheese." Not even thinking about, well. Maybe I should have been saving a little more for myself the last six months, the last year, right? Creating that rainy day fund. There's too much dependence on big government for free cheese today in this in this country. And that's that's a societal problem and is why, you know, in working through this book, Freedom at Risk, why I broke the chapters out the way I did, because I need the reader to understand what we are going through today is not just a political problem you know we hear a lot in the media about you know president biden and, and trump and all that okay but we have a problem within our education system number one we have a problem with society and how society is behaving number two sure we have a problem with the political system number three we also have a problem with the economy stealing our freedoms right and we also have a problem with the monetary system stealing our freedoms so that's why i broke out all those issues separately and i made society and why we're kind of digging in here talking about society why i made a uh, society a um, a standalone chapter because it's important that freedoms are sometimes freely given up by ourselves right by society um and we need to understand, you know, uh, the Ukrainians uh, right now, they, they understand what freedom is. Oh, yeah. Ab absolutely. And, In uh, fact, um, the Russians, I believe, were surprised that the Ukrainians would even defend their country. Yeah. And that's why this thing is dragged on for so long, because the Ukrainians had tasted freedom for about 20 years and grew to like self-governance. So you're absolutely right. And um, I've often pondered the question of how much support is too much support for people? Mm -hmm. You know, if you give them too much support, they don't go off to do their own thing and they're not motivated to do so. And I think that line is different for almost everyone. But to your point, um, many immigrant families are too proud to rely on handouts. And they will work the 12 hour days, take the shift on Saturday and Sunday to have enough money to be able to probably say they can afford to do certain things, put food on the, on the table, fix the roof when it needs to be fixed. That kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. One of the, one of the things I want to, I want to get your perspective on Dimitri is, you know, you're, you're at a point in, point in your life where you are facing into retirement, right? God bless you. You've had a very successful career, right? A, a, a beautiful man, beautiful family man with kids and, and grandkids now, right? So uh, wonderful. So you're facing into retirement. How do your freedoms look facing into retirement? Are you concerned about them? 
today? Do you think you're going to have more freedoms as you retire, you know, in, into the twilight hour? Or what? what's your thoughts there? Um, my sense, and you've known me for years, is I've tried to position myself to retire and be able to continue my lifestyle. As far as freedoms are concerned, I've been genuinely concerned at some of the actions of our government and the way that the government has responded to the challenges in the last few years. Hmm. Um, I don't want to turn this into a political discussion, but an attack on one justice, in my opinion, is a, an attack on all justices. And the government is only one election for being flipped, but the rules tend to stay the same. And if our senior people in government are not protected, then I will tell you, we're not going to be protected either. Um, we lived through the riots of the 60s, and uh, I lived in inner city Syracuse at the time. And there was some genuine concern about our personal safety. Mm -hmm. uh, my father bought a shotgun and slept on the front porch. He was not going to dial 911 <laughs> and hope somebody showed up in time. That's right. You know? And so many people make fun of me, as you know, and my wife, lovely person. But sometimes she doesn't understand my perspective. And yeah. the perspective is stand on your own two feet and take care of yourself. Yeah. And if you have a little bit of extra money, food, clothes, just give it to somebody who needs it. Yeah. However, don't give it to someone who refuses to get out of bed in the morning and take there care of There you go. Themselves. You got to be productive. People have to be productive. And, and unfortunately, the political environment we, we have today is... Uh, almost everything they do is contrary to helping people be productive, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, so you're concerned from, uh, you know, from a freedom standpoint uh, due to the due to the political environment um, about your future going into retirement. What about, you know, I know you have a granddaughter, a beautiful granddaughter. Congratulations. And you have an, another grandchild on the way. Uh, so what are your thoughts there in terms of the freedoms they're going to have? Do you think they're going to have more or less freedoms? Well, I think as time goes on, every form of government tries to reduce the freedoms of its population. And I, I, I am positive that that will continue happening. Hmm. It, it's up to... Um, our electoral process to try to steer the country if people believe it's going in the wrong way. Yeah. Um, and I think you're seeing a, a push and a pull between different segments here in the States um, as to which way people want to go. Um, and I think that my granddaughter and future grandson will have their hands full but if i can help them and my son and my daughter-in-law can help them my wife can help them they'll be okay yeah i think the the one of the things because you bring many things to the table in terms of helping them one of the things which is huge is what you've done which is take action right uh you are in a place now where you can retire, you know, because you've taken action, you've, you've put plans in place, you've studied certain things, you've invested certain ways, right? You've done things, you've taken action to be able to afford yourself this good return on life, right? Um, and that's one of the things uh, that I think you uh, can definitely pass down to your grandkids is that, uh, that spirit of taking action, not expecting people just to give it to you, right? Because you're entitled to it, 
uh, when I was growing up, <laughs> my, my parents would, uh, and you know this well, my, my parents uh, would blatantly tell me I am entitled to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I must work. I must work for it. Um, and that's, that's the culture and the society they came from. They had a very strong work ethic, right? And so they instilled that in me. Uh, and so now I, I feel, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a productive member of society. I'm doing, you know, good stuff out there and helping people and adding value each and every day. And I think that's, you know, likewise, uh, you've done the same. And, you know, you can bring that to your grandkids and say, hey, yeah, you're not entitled. You have to be productive. You know, don't accept the, the block of cheese from the government. Um, do stuff for yourself so that, you know, when there's a rainy day, you can take care of yourself. Right. So, That's right. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of good, good lessons. So I feel I feel better that our next generation coming up and our future generations are have a fighting chance, at least. So, Dimitri, thank you so much for coming on today. I truly appreciate you sharing your stories, your perspective on the Ukraine and uh, any any last thoughts, any last words you want to share? Well, I, I wanted to thank you for helping instill that attitude with my son alexander <laughs> i i have a free book waiting for him <laughs> <laughs> excellent <laughs> thank you for having me on absolutely thank you dimitri and i i, I wish uh dimitri's ukrainian uh brethren there uh much success in their fight for freedom our our thoughts and our hearts are definitely with them uh it's a very difficult situation as we can all imagine out there. So, all right, uh, folks, I wanted to uh, wrap it up from there. Uh, you've heard me uh, <laughs> yammer on enough uh, today. So uh, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, wow, what a what a great group of guests we had on today. Uh, thank you all again for coming on. I appreciate you guys. You guys have been my teachers. You guys have been leaders and rock stars and all that you you do and. Uh, and tremendous help you've given me. So thank you so much. Um, we've only touched the very tip of the iceberg here. We've been on for a little over two hours here. We've only touched the tip of the iceberg that we cover in this book, Freedom at Risk. Uh, wow, there's so much more to discover in terms of how to protect your personal and financial freedoms. So I encourage folks to go onto the website, freedomatriskbook.com. Take a look at that website. And take a look at the bonuses you can um, you can get by buying one, two, or three books. Okay, um, there are some some great bonuses, free bonuses that we have put out there that have taken uh, taken a lot of time and energy <laughs> to put together by the team. And so, uh, make sure you go there to sign up for your bonuses after you purchase the book. And um, yeah, uh, you don't. You certainly don't want to miss out on those because they are packed with value. So uh, again, thank you for joining me here today on this live stream. I appreciate all you guys for tuning in. I truly do. Um, my name again is Tony Lopes, and I would encourage you to go out and grab your copy of the book, Freedom at Risk, How to Protect Your Personal and Financial Freedoms. It's available today on Amazon. You'll be glad you did. Thank you all for tuning in.